who've been in the Ruby community for a while have watched the evolution of uh, the sort of testing methodologies and frameworks. I mean, five, seven years ago, uh, relative to where we are today, testing kind of sucked. We were still in the throes of discovering dynamic languages and, uh, you know, hadn't really figured out how to uh, uh, make up for the loss of static type checking and stuff in the compilers. We were realizing we needed to do it. Um, and I think now what we've done is we've sort of gone well past that into the realm of testing things that in the past uh, we didn't really test. And we try to model user behavior with frameworks like RSpec and Cucumber, and it's awesome. Um, the, uh, the thing is that the responsiveness of our applications, right, is arguably just another feature if you think about it in terms of the user's perception. So a slow application might as well not have any features at all. And so we're into the realm of load testing. And what we're hoping to do here today is kind of take, uh, there's been many, many people who have worked on the solutions uh, associated that have got us to where we are today with functional and unit testing. Um, and we're hoping to make a little small step forward uh, in, in terms of uh, load testing. And, and we're going to sort of try to drop some knowledge here. Uh, we've got an interesting demo, hopefully, if everything goes well. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, we'll, um, I'll do that. I guess uh, I'll hand it off to you, though, since I obviously showed up here. So I'm an ops guy. But the, I think you, the load testing, or I'm sorry. Unit and functional testing in Ruby, you guys have really taken a step up, and maybe more importantly, we can tie this to CI and continuous integration, and it's, it's wonderful. And I think there's, we can all agree that load testing is as critical as unit and functional tests. We gotta make sure our application loads, we have to actually care about the user experience. Further, this should also be tied to CI. The only way we can be confident about our stacks is if we load test as part of every commit that we ever do into our repository. Maybe most importantly is, as an ops guy, nothing's more frustrating than a developer or a stack falling and a developer telling me, well, it worked on local, so surely it's an operational. And then we get in fights. <laughs> so luckily there are plenty of tools, maybe not as many tools as the unit and functional testing community, but there are some. And some, you know, ABCHPs with machine guns is a wonderful app from News App, the Chicago Tribune folks, where they spin up many testers, small micro instances to test some server. And you've seen this before. Here's an output from AB, lots of numbers. Here's an output from Siege, lots of numbers. When you're looking at a lot of these, it's really, you can imagine, it gives you a headache, right? I mean, it's, it's very hard to read those. And we get, maybe more importantly, we get some numbers, success, errors, what have you. We can drive it via CLI so I can tie this into CI <coughs> easily. But I'm not really measuring anything. I'm not going to hammer, I don't, I, I don't care how Apache responds. I'm fairly confident in Apache. I care more about going through a real user experience. Maybe I'm bound by the database, maybe I/O, or maybe logging. And we can't do that unless I think that's proxy. Not, unless we actually test it. You're confident in proxy. But I do love proxy. I do love HA proxy. So then, folks that have taken steps forward. There's HTTP. I love HTTP. There's also Auto Bench, which, which is a wrapper around it. And the idea is let's ramp up connections and see where our connections fall, or our user experience falls off the table. Again. Nice output, but the things that it adds is we get standard deviation, the idea that I don't care about the mean, I care about the users in the extremes, I care about the edge case. We get connections versus requests versus latency. Um, Dad has a lot of thoughts about that. Yeah, so this is one of these things that uh, hopefully we can, for those of you who haven't run into these things, maybe we can uh, help you avoid a, a little bit of a pothole. So connections is a great example of an area where you can go badly wrong if you don't really uh, control sort of the whole stack of your testing. Uh, if you're trying to simulate user behavior, and this is something, for example, the HTTP curve does really, really well, uh, you, you want to avoid pooling connections, for example, reusing sockets, things that, in fact, in, in many contexts, you actually want to do. 
I think Jeremy talked earlier about uh, you know wanting to you know keep a connection alive as long as possible. You know, normally you want to do that, but if you're actually trying to simulate independent users, right? Not only do they not not only are your users not on localhost, uh, they're also not going to be sharing a socket, uh, except in very strange and rare circumstances. So it's an area where you want to make sure that uh, you have. Uh, control over what's going on. Do you, do you want keep alive or don't you? Do you want to do you want to have separate connections being opened, or do you want to reuse sockets? So, perhaps one of the bigger problems is I'm bound by the tester. It's, it's just as likely that my tester will fall before my staff falls. So of course, it's distributed. So auto bench comes back up. Auto perf is a wonderful tool tool from iBreakWork, the speedy Google guy where let's just branch this out to many machines so we can have many testers to one server. Your friendly system in probably likes plain old SSH loops. I do. So here's an example of, in this case, we're running HTTP perf across eight boxes. I just run it through an SSH loop, just a for loop through some lists, and just background these processes, and I get a big dump of shit on my screen. And again, you're trying to make sense of this and figure out, all right, did architecture A outperform architecture? I don't know. I, have, I don't know, I can't, that's, it's, it's confusing. You start looking at, and they all run together after a while, and is that 1,400, 14,000, I don't know. So what I do is I push this up to chest, I curl that chest, I pipe it through some ugly curl one liner, because I like curl, <laughs> and I get an output that I can iterate over. So all I care about is numbers, yeah, and the concept that I can go back to the chest and look for real specific data. But I just want something I can iterate over and I can pull data really quickly. So, some folks have extended this idea. Uh, there's Funklow, there's Sung, there's JMeter. Dan's played with a few things. Yeah, well, not necessarily personally, but as, a, as an organization, we did look at both Sung and Funklow. The short version is, uh, or not Funklow, uh, JMeter. We didn't really want to do the Java stuff uh, to do JMeter, and we didn't really want to deal with all the XML stuff. There, but they're, they're on the right track, and this it reminds me again of the evolution of these kinds of tool sets. Uh, again, if we look at performance and responsiveness of an app as a usability thing, this is really kind of just a, uh, an extension of what we already do with TDD and RSpec and Cucumbers. Um, and these are going in the right direction. We want to distribute the load just like real users are distributed, and uh, we want to uh, we want to be able to model actual user behavior just as we do with cucumbers. We just didn't quite feel, uh, personally, I'm not uh, casting stones, uh, there's a lot of great work that's gone into this. We didn't feel like these quite fit our requirements, but they are out there. And as a for example, I wanted to love Punk Load, it's called Punk Load. But the, <laughs> I, I couldn't, I, I spent more time trying to graph the documentation, and I went back to running HTTP for some of this. There's also some folks who are starting to treat load testing as a service. There's some folks at JMeter providers. Uh, Blitz.io is one that, I don't know, we kind of did. And they provide these nice charge response times, hit rates, lots of JavaScript. But perhaps the most important thing we always have to remember is the ultimate number we're caring about is how many users we can stick in the box, and therefore how we're going to scale our stack. Which, from that data, we infer dollar per user. So, it's so cheap, like we still haven't written a line of code. The, and this is so easy and it's shocking how many people don't do this. And, and it reminds me again of where we were five, seven years ago, depending on how early you adopted the stuff with, the, uh, with all of our functional and unit tests. Uh, you know, we, now I think most people would be sort of, would view it as a violation of best practices if you didn't, uh, some people would even say if you didn't start with the functional or unit tests. And uh, I read all the time people bragging about, you know, the latest benchmark of this Ruby server or that Ruby server or what Node is doing or whatever the hell. Um, and so it's clearly important to people. People kind of get off on it, but we're not at the stage where we're saying, look, you know, let's start off with what are our performance goals and let's make sure that we have a testing strategy already in place from the beginning. And I'm saying that as, you know, somebody, we ourselves, it's all we sort of, I think maybe we do it a little earlier than a lot of people, but we're still not at the point where we're defining that really up front. We're trying to hopefully get there. And, and while these tools aren't quite all the way there, we, we can identify it, much like the testing problem. Let's identify our problems and let's make it better. So, we give a gift to you. 
We have a AWS AMI that's public. It has all these tools. It has many more. I like GitHub. There's Shane Becker, or I'm sorry, Evan Phoenix once put up a gist recently a couple months ago of how he load tested, and I found that interesting. So we've got a bunch of stuff in Opt, a bunch of projects. It's yours. We also tune the kernel, so you're not going to get blocked by a U limit. You're not going to get blocked by, I don't know, max backlogs and time wait or max backlogs into. And this was, this, so this is a product we, we, we've been going through many, many iterations of uh, stuff that we're going to present here. Uh, and this is a product of a lot of learning that we've gone through, packaged up into, this is the AMI that we basically use when we're going to spin up a box that we're going to do load testing. So we thought we'd share that and, uh, you know, we love, we love Carlo. So, the, mind you, by this kernel tuning, this is not a production server. This is a load tester where the kernel will not save you. Your, your shit will fall. So, but the idea is I want to make my stack fall before I make my load tester fall. So you just simply need more load testers. Uh, you can get this from, again, AMI's community repos. I'll stick this up into some repo on Spire.io, maybe some chef recipes of Puppet for new DevOps from repos, and you should use it. And I think once you use it, especially if you're in the cloud, you'll realize that AWS fuck you. They will completely fuck you. So let me give you a, a, a I thought story. we were going to go with the sense first. Screw you. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> let me give you an example. We went through a sprint before doing a minimum viable product where for about two weeks, I'm tweaking everything I can in the kernel. And we get to the point where we're doing very, we're getting very small incremental improvements. And I've got numbers flying everywhere. And I started losing my shit because at uh, 3 o'clock I could run a test and it was better than a test I ran at noon. And there's a moment of going like, well then what am I measuring? How am I supposed to iterate over this? And, and what am I supposed to do? And here's an example. So same box, same stack, I didn't reboot anything. I didn't get into a better neighborhood. I got twice, over twice the concurrency on my stack from Friday to Sunday. And I don't know what happened in those past two weeks. Like what? There. And, and well, at these one are, point, you thought you were a genius for something, and it turned out that you weren't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this happens a lot. And you know, when you talk to AWS about this, they'll tell you ridiculous things. The you're in a bad neighborhood. Yeah, noisy neighbors. My, but, my favorite is the last one. Like, so, like, yeah. I mean, thank I you. Can, thank you for that information. I can use as much CPU as I have CPU. I can use as much bandwidth as bandwidth is available. And you know, the the thing is, is well, these are real. By the way, this is a these are real responses from AWS support. The, I mean, we're, we're not idiots. So we realize that there's a bunch of folks on a Zen instance. We've got some buffer into the NIC, maybe multiple NICs, and we're all competing for this resource. And we're doing it all on someone else's network, which is fine. Right? This is why we went into the cloud for the first place. We can spin down boxes, we can spin up boxes, and we trade this convenience. But the thing to remember is, I'm talking about an expensive box. It's not cheap, like that, that benchmark I showed you. And I'm getting a C1 extra large because I know I'm going to be CPU bound. But I never get CPU bound because I'm blocked by the NIC. I can get a big memory box, but I'm never going to actually use the memory because I can't get that many connections into the box so I can stretch my resource. And back to the dollar per user, there, there's a moment where you have to stop and think, like, what, what's the point of getting a huge service, and how can you even know this? How can you know how you're going to scale, or how much are your stacks going to cost, unless you, you scale, or unless you test it, unless we get some of this data. So, ops are around for a reason. We know boxes degrade, we monitor, we maybe walk our logs, and we see how much we've already caused users pain, like, oh great, like I've got a user sitting around forever for a response. And ultimately, maybe the thing that aggravates me the most is, we accept magic. On AWS, we do stupid shit like, let's just bring down this box and spin up a new box. Like, fuck it, I don't know what's happening. Like, reboot it three times. And that's, that, that's ridiculous. But it works. So if we're going to get fucked, <laughs> let's, figure out, let's figure out how badly we're getting fucked. And at least get some data. Like, I mean, at this stage. Where let's, let's understand what's happening before. And, and just see. Just to see what happens. Yeah, and, I mean, it, Basically, like we all, everybody, I don't know, how many people here are like actively using cloud for their applications right now? So about a third, maybe? So a third of the audience is prone to getting clouds. <laughs> <laughs> so again, this is one of the things that the, a good load testing, good agile load testing strategy that's consistent with what we already do with our, our uh, functional unit tests, at least gives you visibility into precisely how you're getting fucked or what likely uh, 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 possible ways that, that that will happen. 
Um, so I'm going to go back, though. Uh, so now we're going to shift over into the, uh, the developer part of the talk. What? letting me just ramble on when no one could understand what I was saying. So I'm going to take a step back and I want to take a step back and talk a little bit uh, about uh, what? Is it there here? Yeah. Oh, I'm just paranoid now. It's all. <laughs> uh, one of the things we do really well with our functional unit tests is we model user behavior. We're, we're getting better and better at that. We've got great frameworks to do that. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we could do that uh, with our load tests as well. Uh, so one of the one of the best ways to do that is to actually look at your logs or look at the queues that you've already done if you're doing that kind of stuff, uh, and make sure that you're building out scenarios that uh, in your load tests that aren't just you know your users aren't going to be sitting there refreshing the home page as fast as they possibly can like you might might do with sort of an A/B type of test. So. Uh, you've got uh, you've got some good potential data already there about what your users are doing, so so use it. Um, modeling behavior is uh, a complex problem, but we already fortunately have programming languages that help us model complex problems. So this is one of the issues, and again, I, I don't want to get into knocking other uh, approaches to this problem, but one of the issues that we ran into was you might want to might think of it as almost premature frameworkization. Uh, I literally just made that up, um, but you can use it if you want. Um, we're, uh, instead of just saying, look, let's just start with the basic, let's see if we can even just kind of script up uh, in a dynamic language, uh, user behavior, um, you know, there's sort of this thing of, okay, we're going to have this configuration file, and, and we just sort of ended up feeling like, you know, that's kind of premature for where we're at. Uh, another issue when you're dealing with, certainly if you're dealing with, with, what we have is we've sort of segregated the problem into our client apps and we have our APIs. And a, lot of, a lot of you probably do the same kind of thing. Uh, and so we don't really need to, uh, we sort of know that the client side of it's running, I mean, it's, its scale is at the, at the scale of like a user in a web browser session. Uh, so all we really need to do is make sure our APIs scale and we'll be fine. Uh, and that means that we need, and if you're using REST APIs uh, or even sort of just lightweight HTTP APIs, you really need to make sure that you have a solid HTTP <coughs> file. Uh, and by that, specifically, we want to have low-level control. Again, Jeremy earlier mentioned that uh, Keepalyze is a great example of the kind of low-level control error handling, making sure that we're not accidentally reusing sockets when we're trying to simulate separate users. Uh, and then, of course, the thing that everybody, you know, the big buzz, the evented I.O. stuff, uh, we wanted to uh, make sure that we were getting, one of the nice things about having this segregated approach where you're just slamming an API instead of using some of that cucumber that's uh, hitting like a web browser, is that you can, you can run a lot more users, perhaps, on a single machine. Uh, but we wanted to make sure, you know, obviously the more that you get, uh, the more users you can simulate on a box up to a point of, some percentage, if you're trying to, because you want to also spread, like your users are spread out, you want to spread out the, uh, the source of the testing. Um, so basically, you know, up to a point, we want to make sure that we're getting uh, as much bang for each box as we can in terms of load, because that brings down the costs of running our load tests, which in turn makes it easier to run them more often and, and make them part of, say, a continuous integration or deployment process. So, uh, Refrain from the booze. Uh, we actually, for our, in, my, in our defense, we use Ruby on in the actual implementation of our stack. Uh, but we decided that for right now, where things are at, um, Node is a little more baked in this regard. There's some really interesting work. Uh, I would, uh, I'm really interested, in, for example, in uh, Tony Arcieri's work on Celluloid I/O uh, in terms of helping uh, Ruby kind of get to this point. Um, but if it, when we started this effort, we sort of felt like Node was a little bit further uh, ahead and things were a little more baked. Uh, and in particular, it has a solid HTTP core library. Uh, and then we wrapped it with something that we call Shred, which is a uh, very REST-friendly HTTP wrapper. 
uh, runs as it can run as a node uh, library or it can also run in the browser. So here is uh, some just some quick. I'm not going to necessarily go through this in detail, but to give you an idea of the kind when I say REST friendly, you know, we wanted to be able to use HTTP uh, sort of you know in all of its glory, meaning we want to be able to easily set headers and deal with all kinds of different possible response codes and so on. And so that's that gives us kind of the foundation that we need um, for uh, scripting our scenarios. So the next piece of that was. Uh, uh, to actually start encapsulating bits and pieces of user behavior, and we just did it as functions. So here's an example uh, of a uh, of just us. We're just encapsulating very simple. This is testing our Spire I/O uh, messaging service, and we're we're just encapsulating a subscribe. And right here, you can see that we're saying, okay, um, this is the the test has finished. So there's nothing complicated or fancy about this. We just embed right in the scripts you know, where tests start and finish, uh, and that gives us uh, a great deal of flexibility in terms of how we set up our, our test scenarios. <coughs> so, Carlo denies coining this term, but I, I think he actually did. Uh, well, now he's inclined maybe to take the credit, but it depends on how people respond, I guess. So. Uh, distributedly, we wanted to run our tests distributedly, like our users are. The users are distributedly, and so we wanted to uh, we wanted to make sure that our tests are running all over the place. Uh, and so this, we've been working on this thing called Dolphin, and the reason we called it Dolphin was that uh, we had the internal system that we had built was called Shark. So we figured it would be kind of cool to have dolphins attacking a shark. Um, and the idea is that we run these pods uh, all over the world. Uh, and we're going to run them. Uh, you don't have your, is your mic? <laughs> we're running them where today? So today we're running them from Tokyo, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Ireland, AWS East, and AWS West. Now, now, mind you, one of the great things about this is a pod is actually subscribing to the Spire I/O service. So I'm not opening any ports to this pod. It's just a client, and we're going to push data into that client. So the pods then work with an overlord through a mechanism I'm going to describe in a second. But right now what I'm going to do, the cool thing about the overlord is it basically controls all the pods. I'm going to run, uh, and, uh, and you can run, as a result, I can run the tests and control the tests from anywhere. I can control them from my Mac, um, even though I'm not really running or constrained to what my Mac can do as far as load testing. So what I want to do here is I'm just going to go ahead and tell all these pods that are all over the world, uh, whoops, uh, to uh, go ahead and uh, um, start running these tests. And so that, with that segue, I will go back. Well, that's happening. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to come back over here. So this is the last test we ran. And we're going to see the results show up here. Um, but while that's running, I'm going to talk just for a second about um, the uh, the architecture that we're testing, just so you have an idea of what we're testing, and also then how the Dolphin architecture works. So basically, without going into a lot of detail, we put a lot of time in this diagram, uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> we don't really have time to go through it in detail. Uh, basically, it's a worker-based architecture, so we have workers, we use Redis as sort of our transport, if you will, uh, and we have some uh, ALB with uh, hot proxy for failover and load balancing, uh, some more intelligent load balancing, and then we got these dispatchers, and all the dispatch the dispatcher's job, and this again goes to the point Jeremy made in his presentation, all the dispatch their job is to sort of process those things as quickly as possible, either turn them into tasks or return an error, uh, and then from there the workers go, and so that way we don't ever have sort of the equivalent, especially in combination with the uh, uh, use of invented I.O. there, we don't have any long running requests uh, to block anything. Um, now, so let's see how we're doing with our tests. I'm still, still cranking away over here. Uh, and I'm going to move. So hopefully you'll be able to, I don't know if you can see. Yeah, hopefully we'll see the chart update in the background once the results are in. So, so a good use case for this is we're, having, we're running an AWS because we have an AWS account. And it's trivial to spin up these instances. But in a case where we have a potential customer in China, I can have pods running on client machines on customer or consumer facing networks and there's very little overhead. We can just have a box there and we can actually infer how much latency is happening through each network. 
maybe more interesting is I can do something like obviously on AWS I don't have control over BGP routing and kind of doing the magic. But I might be able to do something as simple as I don't know, flip from AWS East to well, AWS the, West. Well, the demo goblins have attacked this. So I swear to God, we ran this about 30 times before the presentation. Uh, I'm going to give it just a second. How are we doing on time, Kobe? Five minutes? All right. Um, we're going to just give all the possible breather. <coughs> More of a superstition than an actual. So hopefully this time it will. We got eight? Okay, we got eight. So we can do something as, as simple as actually understand the user experience. Like, or in the case of California, I can have um, just en enough pods to get a statistical sample now on Roadrunner, and I can have a bunch of them on Comcast. And it turns out Comcast has a shitty connection to North Northern California, but maybe it's great over to Oregon. So let's float them. Let's float this service. Let's let's get these guys where they get their service fastest. And that's what's nice about this particular load testing is, again, very little overhead. I don't actually need any ports open on the machine, on the, on the client factory. So <laughs> for ops, this is actually really, really cool. And so again, we, the idea was to try to get our tests agile. Uh, the, the graph, as you can see, is a little easier to read. The architecture here uses, the cool thing here is we're using Spire.io to actually test Spire.io. We're using the message service to coordinate. So basically, the overlord sends a message uh, out to any pods that happen to be listening on the channel, which the cool thing is we can just spin these pods up and we don't have to put it in, they're not in a configuration file or anything like that. Uh, and then when a test starts, the pods just sort of raise their hands and say, yeah, well, I'm participating. And we know, okay, we've got X number of pods running and then we just kind of go from there. Once the results come back in, instead of having Carlo write a, a, a wonky Perl script, sorry, Carlo, I'm sure it's beautiful. Perl thing. rules. <laughs> uh, we actually munge the stuff together, uh, and, and then we do one last step, which is how the browser updates, which is we actually send out another message to any, any clients, any Dolphin clients who are saying, I'm interested in whatever load test results you have. Uh, and when this comes back, hopefully we'll actually see. Uh, did it update? Did anybody see an update? It didn't look like the background updated. It didn't? It didn't look like it. Okay. Um, Network problems? Let me just refresh. It may have lost its. Oh, yeah, it's right. Okay, so does, that, does everybody see that looks different than the last graph? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the cool thing here is instead of now, instead of looking at these, this thing with all these numbers and getting a headache, and, and it's, believe me, I mean, when you're actually trying to do it in agile fashion, it is actually very easy to make a colossal mistake and be like, oh, architecture A is better. And actually, no, it, it isn't. It's much worse. It's like an order of magnitude worse, but you just got freaked out staring at all the, the numbers. So this makes it much easier. I can look at it and go, okay, this is weird. Why did it get faster and higher? So this is, by the way, this is concurrency along the bottom. I mean, we can do different variations of this graph. This is just what this one does. And then the response time for that particular scenario. So we can see, uh, based on the region, and the regions are color-coded, we can quite sort of see, uh, you know, hey, uh, uh, this is about where we're at, and there's not any one region in this particular run that looks terrible. Uh, South America, let's see, we got... U.S. East is, is at times a little slow. U.S. West, Avi, everyone's like right there is very slow. So that kind of goes to the UR clock if you're using the cloud. So you've got to run a lot of these, which sort of makes, if you're in the cloud, which makes sort of the point that uh, it's really good to be able to run a lot of them cheaply. And for ops, I guess, it's that we can keep running. It's easy. It's easy to tie into our CI environment. And the most important thing to load testing is you got to actually load test. you got to drop the pain to, to execute. Just like we have with functional unit testing. Uh, one last point um, that uh, we, we actually wanted to, we're, we're planning to release this as open source for those of you who might be interested about how we're doing this or looking at the code or playing with it. Uh, we didn't <laughs> quite get to the point where uh, we were ready to do that for this conference unfortunately, but uh, if you're interested in ultimately down the road uh, uh, kicking the tires on this, playing with it, maybe uh, uh, you know using it for your own purposes, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, let us know. Uh, we're at these are all, all the things that you need to know about how to get a hold of us. So please don't hesitate to uh, to, to you know ping us if you're interested in um, in working on this project. <laughs>
Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.